Well, good morning and welcome to New Life. We're glad that you could join us here uh, virtually if you couldn't enjoy us uh, together in, in the sanctuary and all that kind of good things. Uh, I hope you had a good week. Uh, it's always shocking to be these these super cold temperatures. I remember, you know, growing up in Kansas and Colorado, we didn't we didn't get these kind of extreme cold moments. And uh, the, the very first house that we owned, uh, those pops that happen in the middle of the night and you're just sleeping there, minding your own business and all of a sudden, pow, it's like, whoa, what just happened? And, uh, for, you know, for the, the kid who didn't know anything about that uh, kind of stuff, it was it was a shocker to me. So, uh, my house was popping uh, quite a bit this week in the middle of some cold mornings and uh, hope you're able to stay warm in the middle of all those things. It's uh, it's good to be from Minnesota, right? We can uh, we can deal with the cold. So uh, I hope you're warm even if uh, the outdoors has been cold. Uh, it's been a good week for me, uh, doing lots of different things and uh, trying to stay, stay on top of uh, all the things that are going on, making a few plans. Uh, here for the future for uh, the Lent season, and uh, we're going to be thinking ahead to Easter and Good Friday and those things that are that are uh, coming up. It's it's hard to believe that those kinds of things are uh, need to be in our thought process, but that's uh, kind of where we find ourselves in. So um, I hope you're uh, I hope things are going well for you. Uh, we're going to continue on our little journey talking about uh, foundations and, and using kind of building illustrations to, uh, to think about. Uh, the, the things that we're thinking about uh, in the, in God's Word here this morning. And so um, let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, it, it's uh, good to be your sons and daughters. It's good to be uh, a part of the building process. It's good to be uh, in your hands. It's good to uh, experience your patience and your love and your kindness and your example uh, and your asking things of us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to uh, to be eager to, uh, to get better, uh, to be more and more like you. In your name I pray. Amen. So last week we talked about foundations and we talked about the importance of a foundation and uh, some of the principles that go into uh, putting in a good foundation and how firm and solid and how well thought out that needs to be. And really the, the bigger the building, the bigger the, the thing that's going on, the more secure that has to be. And so you have to you have to be able to be uh, thinking about those kinds of things. And so we, uh, we talked about that foundation and uh, that spiritual foundation that is our lives um, for for us as in, in a spiritual sense uh, that foundation is rooted in our understanding of sin uh, rooted in understanding that we fall short of God's glory and that we've not measured up um, and and God in his justice has to do something about that but because God is kind and God's merciful and God's gracious uh, he sent his one and only son to die on a cross for us so that we could be forgiven uh, and and what a great thing that that is for us to see and understand and and so you and I get invited into a relationship with Christ um, with him being one our savior uh, the, the recognized need that uh, I could not acquire for myself the thing that I need I couldn't acquire forgiveness I can't be good enough to uh, to kind of overcome the ways that I've fallen short and so the the, the humility that's needed to recognize that I just need to uh, enter into this relationship with God with the starting premise that I'm sorry, that I've fallen short. Um, I'm in need of you to make something new. And God makes things new. And we could go on to a whole sermon series about how God makes things new. And God removes from our uh, our a heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. And uh, those, those things happen. And the Bible goes on then to speak about transformation and all that um, all that good stuff. And so, the, and so not only is God our Savior, but He's our Lord as well, that He has the right to ask things of us, to uh, point us in directions, to grab our attention and invite us to, to rethink the way things are going and to, uh, uh, to do what He wants. And so that's the invitation that God lays out before us. And so, um, so we got a foundation, right? If, if you are lived in a construction moment, you got that foundation poured. It's uh, sat there for how, however many days before you should start working on it. And uh, it's it's been a good foundation. And usually, you know, the, depending on the project, uh, and I've lived in uh, both of these worlds where at some point in time, the project is so big uh, that you got to come up with a plan. Now, we've all lived in moments where, you know, you're building a birdhouse. How much of a plan do you need? Uh, maybe some of you are more into larger plans and some of you are like, well, let's just wing it. It's just a birdhouse, right? Uh, but when you get into building a building or, or doing something that 
uh, is a little bit more significant. You got to figure out all the things that you need. And so oftentimes, uh, case in point here with church that, uh, that was built uh, by many of you, there's blueprints. Someone goes to the great lengths of not only drawing uh, an exterior facade or a little, little map that has all the little boxes that is my office and church and school and uh, uh, nursery and all those kinds of things. It, it's uh, uh, it's a blueprint that expresses, you know, exactly how we're going to build the walls, uh, where the electrical outlets are going to go, where the uh, plumbing systems are going to go, or all the diff different systems of our building are going to go, and they're they're laid out, and they're it's it's an obvious thing for us. Um, and if you're in a construction business at all, you know full well that one of your tasks is to consult that blueprint. It's time to look at the blueprint and see what we need to do, and so. Um, the beautiful thing about a blueprint is that it's someone's already done all of the thinking, right? Some engineer had to come up with a plan for how this was supposed to go. It's not like you and I have to re-engineer it or rethink it. It's been laid out there for us. And so that's that's a great gift to us. And if you've ever been, uh, you know, one of those moments where you, you walk into the kitchen, you're like, oh, what, what, what was I here for? Right. Uh, it, it's in the construction world. Uh, there's an opportunity for you to know exactly. Here's what you need to do. Here's the thing. We're going to lay it out. Here's what you need to do. And so uh, contractors and all those kinds of people love blueprints. It, it creates a clarity about what needs to happen so that we can enter into doing the, the work. And so um, what does that look like in lieu of uh, us as believers? And what does it look like in, in lieu of building this building that God has uh, to build for us? And so um, the thing I kept thinking about this week is the whole uh, idea of like stepping back. So take a step back to see what needs to be done and then press in to doing it, right? And so what's... And, and you, you have to kind of have the big picture in mind. It's it's very easy to get myopic and like focus on uh, such a small piece of it that we forget to look at the big picture. And every once in a while, it's an important thing to look at the big picture. So you and I are going to, we've got this foundation. Uh, we recognize our need for a Savior and for forgiveness. And God's graciously given it to us um, through his gift of the Son. And we've uh, we've repented and we've moved into a relationship with him. And what does it look like? To build a life. And so really the goal uh, is to kind of go back to those plans and look at what the goal is. So um, for those of you that are maybe saw the bulletin uh, somehow, uh, I put the wrong verse in. So <laughs> as I'm sitting here planning, like, wait, that verse doesn't like relate at all. But anyway, it's 2 Corinthians 3.18 that I want us to put our attention on. And it says this, uh, we all uh, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. And so there's this, uh, a couple of things in here that are important for us to think about. We all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. There's this, uh, Thinking about who God is and thinking about uh, what God's like, uh, that is an important piece for us. It's, it's just like the whole, the whole notion of modeling, right? Um, if, you, if you've got dogs, for example, and so you've got an older dog uh, that's still <laughs> young enough to be obedient and good and all that kind of stuff, they can go a long ways in the training of a younger dog because now you've got this dog that knows how to sit and knows how to heal and knows how to fetch and knows how to uh, stay before we come inside the house or stay before we get permission to go eat our food. All those kinds of things that uh, if you've got an older dog who's able to teach your younger dog how to do those things, it just goes a whole lot smoother. There's a whole notion of modeling. And so the younger puppy who's energetic and foolish and doesn't know exactly what the expectations are can live in some moment of understanding what those things are by by witnessing the modeling and so what does modeling look like for you and I how do, because all of us are whether we like it or not or whether we think about it or not are moving towards becoming like someone very few of us are are actually capable of staying stagnant and staying exactly where we're at we're always um moving towards um people for whom we think that that way is a good way to go um, and so our lives are in a constant shape, uh, state of transformation, of change, of uh, becoming something else. Um, if you've ever lived in one of those moments, whether you're young or old, 
uh, or you kind of became friends with someone who uh, inspired you to think about things in different ways and, in a positive way and do things in a positive way that was that was good you know you recognize the blessing of that and we've also all lived in those moments where like I you know I spent more time hanging out with someone who was kind of leading me down a wrong path a, a path that I had to choose to not keep going down because that's not the right way so uh, so the, the thing is here and in, in what uh, God's talking about here is uh, that we are being transformed into his image that uh that all of this building project that's going on is about transforming a stack of lumber into a building that's been pre-designed and pre-made and, and thought out and has a blueprint uh and it's it's predictable and it's precise uh and we know exactly wh where it's going and i would say to you that God's plan for my life and your life, uh, while we love to think uh, that all of us are so completely special, that everything about what God wants for me is so unique to me. I mean, that feels good. Uh, but here's the truth of the matter is, uh, God wants all of us to be transformed into the likeness of his son. Right? I mean, that's the goal for every single one of us. And so when it comes to thinking about God's will questions that people tend to have. God's will's questions for most people turn into things like, who should I marry? And what job should I take? And where should I live? And what house should I buy? And uh, all these kinds of things that are like a, this very specific thing. And I'm, and I'm telling you that for the most part, God's more interested in, in things that we maybe would forget about, right? Things like, uh, how much truth do I tell? How frequently can you rely on the things that I say? Uh, am I a person who lives in some envy and jealousy? And am I a person who uh, gossips? Am I a person who undoes the life of other people? You know, what's the kind of person that I am? Those, these are the things that matter the most. And too often we think of God's will only in these, these things about whether or not I should you know, get this chihuahua or not. Um, I'm telling you... God probably doesn't really care if you get a chihuahua or not. What he cares about is that you would be a good owner who would uh, do things well in the middle of your care for that chihuahua. So um, think about those kinds of things. Um, the, uh, the, the word in there that I wanted to address, it says, we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. This transformation, and we could uh, have a sermon about this, but the difference between transformation and uh, being conformed. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. And conformed is like, uh, you know, the, the toys in the sandbox where you pack a bunch of sand into your little sand castle and you flip it upside down and you pull it out and you've got this castle. It's been something that with, with a bunch of pressure and a bunch of uh, tension and a little bit of moisture so that it'll all hold together, uh, we make that thing become the exact thing we want. Uh, but don't be conformed. Don't uh, be pressed into a mold that makes you look exactly like everybody wants you to look like. Be transformed. Uh, and transformation is that idea of metamorphosis that comes from uh, speaking about butterflies and uh, uh, caterpillars and all that kind of thing. That from the inside, something becomes something very different. Um, in the case of the butterfly, exactly different uh, from what it was before. That God is, is changing us from the sinful, fallen mess of a building that we are into something that is in the image of his son. And every once in a while, uh, whenever you're doing a construction project, it's always important to like to, to, to get stuck in the details of what you're doing. But at some point in time, you got to like step back. And it's like, does this look like what it's supposed to look like? Or is something going wrong here? And so it's this uh, concentration on the uh, things that, that matter the most and an ability to step back and see that those things are becoming what they really need to become. And so what does it look like for you and I to become in the, to be recreated in the image of God? I I think sometimes we do uh, a disservice to the idea of of Bible reading and uh, getting into God's Word, and, and we've we've because of our society and because of our uh, kind of obsession with like discovering the truth and finding the truth and and all these things. We I think we think uh, that we go into the Bible to find truth. Um, 
which is not totally wrong, but I, what I want to suggest to you is this, is that one of the things that we're going into God's Word to find is not truth. We're going into uh, to find out what God's like. I mean, the reason why God wrote this book, had this book written for us through the Holy Spirit, and that's a whole other topic as well, uh, but the reason why God had His Word written um, was so you and I could have a revelation of who God is, that we could see and, and imagine what it what it's supposed to look like. You know, you live in you live in a world. If you've ever done any art and and uh, you know drawing and and painting, and my wife's kind of getting into this this kind of stuff, is that you know the first stage of really being able to do art is to see something and copy it. So I see a picture and I'm able to figure out how to to make it look like that. Uh, at some point in time, an artist morphs into the ability to kind of take something that's that's raw it's like a, an image in their head uh, and they're able to transfer that but the beginning stages of learning how to do art is to is the monkey see monkey do uh, I see this and I repeat that and so you know God's word is an attempt on his part to let us know what he's like and in the mi in midst of us knowing what he's like then it's uh, you know these verses like second second Corinthians 3 8 implore us to um, be transformed into his image, that you and I would look like him. And that's an interesting, uh, people come up with very different views on that, right? Like if I, was a, if I was building a building and I was a general contractor, I would, I would look at the blueprints as a gift to me, right? Like I'm not having to reinvent the wheel. I'm not having to, uh, you know, engineer this, this big opening that we have that we drive under when we drive into church. I'm not having to engineer that. All I'm having to do is do what the architect told me to do. And and we never look at that as like, man, I just don't get any freedom. Uh, like, like this is oppressive for me to have to follow the blueprint. I can't, I can't believe that I have to do what the architect tells me I have to do. Oh, what a, what a horrible thing, right? It's a gift. If you've ever been someone who's been uh, living in those moments... Or if you're sometimes in the middle of construction, it's, it gets tiring to problem solve all the time. It's nice to just have the problem solved and just know that if I do what I'm asked to do, this is going to turn out great. And so God in his infinite grace to us offers to us a picture of what he's like. And the invitation is for us is to repeat that and to recognize that uh, Here's something that God asks, and here's something that I'm supposed to do. I'm not quite as good at it as I need to be. Uh, I just got off of practice, and I was in charge of the kindergarten and first graders uh, up at Southridge with basketball. Let me tell you, it was ugly. Ah. <laughs> uh, like, you know, the, the the ability to dribble the ball. Like, it, it just turns into, like, throw it on the ground and try to catch it. Like, as, as though that's dribbling. Or then we're going to shoot the basket. And, you know, so these, some of these kindergartners, I mean, they can barely get it to the bottom of the net, much less have good form, much less uh, try to get it into the, the, the net um, <laughs> and, and be happy about the fact that they had scored. I even had a kid crying because uh, we were working on bounce passes and the pass was coming up to his hands, like in the perfect spot. And he was crying and sad because it was coming up towards his face. I'm like, I don't know how to like work past your sadness in the middle of all this. It's like, it's perfect. It's the plan. It's the way things are supposed to be. Uh, sometimes we get ourselves, somehow there's, there's a difference between the rules of basketball. You only get five people on the court. Well, that's unreasonable. I mean, we should get seven, uh, that, that the court has a boundary. We tried to play tag within a boundary. Kids couldn't understand a boundary. Like, you know, the, the basketball court should be just as big as we want. Like, it should be like two miles. Uh, we should be able to drive from here to someplace else and then have the ball with us. Uh, I mean, there's rules, uh, things that you can't do. You can't travel. You can't uh, double dribble. You can't do all these things. It's, it's a gift to us. Otherwise, the game would be chaos much like it was when we tried to play a game there at the end. Like, nobody was dribbling. Everyone was, like, carrying the ball like rugby. Like, you know, we're going to go, damn. <sighs> There's a blueprint. There's something that's crystal clear, and it's, it, it's a presentation of who God is. And here's what I love about the Bible that I think some people miss, is that 
the Bible would let you know exactly what God's like. And so, um, and God's word is is the same as he is. The reason why this is hard for us to understand is that sometimes your word and my word can be different. I could give you my word and then I could go back on it. I could give you my word and say, I promise that I'm going to do this. And then I could not do that. And I could do something else. And, uh, and you would feel like an injustice has happened because I didn't follow through with my word. And so our word is an important thing. Um, here's the beauty about God is that God is like unable to be different from his word. And so when God gives us a moral code, when God gives us a blueprint, when God says a stud belongs there and a stud belongs there and a header belongs there, that's because that's where it belongs. And, and God is absolutely perfect and knows exactly how it should go. And so I, I always say this about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are God's expression of who he is. He didn't flip a coin and say, well, you know, is lying good or bad? Let's see. Uh, we're going to go with lying bad right? Because I flipped a coin. God says that lying is bad because God is always honest with us. He doesn't lie to us. Uh, you know, is murder good or is murder bad? Well, you know, God says that life is exceptionally valuable and uh, and it should never be taken from someone. I mean, that's not, that's not the way it should happen because God in his infinite wisdom and ability and, and thoughtfulness and the, the person that he is says that life's valuable. We should never snuff out some other life that that would be a bad thing. And so all of these things that God comes up with that, that look like moral rules that maybe we bristle against or have some kind of irritation with, those, those things are all designed to bring life to your life and mine. They are blueprints. They are things that, that tell me exactly where all the outlets are going to be. Why? Because God has like some kind of like, you know, big hang up about where outlets should be. No, it's because it's where they should be. And we live in a lot of like fighting about that, like a bunch of like angst about that sometimes. And, I, and it's always it's always interesting to me I, just from from coaching and, and living inside the lines of uh, football and basketball. There's so much freedom within the boundaries that God has given you on a basketball court, on a football field. There's all kinds of ways to, to play the game. Um, and yet, at the same time, each of us is obligated to uh, follow through with the rules that have been pre-prescribed. And no one argues about those things other than, the, you know, the execution of who fouled and who didn't foul and all that kind of stuff. But no one ever argues, well, yeah, he stepped on line, but it wasn't out of bounds. <sighs> God wants us to live in bounds. Um, God has a blueprint for my life and yours because he knows exactly what this building should look like. My building in your building. And so my, um, uh, as we begin to kind of, again, move into what it looks like to build this thing that God wants for us, um, it is that we are being modeled uh, what a representation of God looks like. And so there's, I mean, we could have, we could turn to a thousand different passages, but I just want to highlight one because it's certainly, uh, certainly common and certainly crystal clear. Uh, what the Bible is saying about who the person of Jesus was. And so Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, um, speaking about imitating Christ's humility. It's a, it's a passage that's painfully clear about what it looks like to be living in the image of God's Son. And so it says this, If any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You know, when God comes down to the earth to die on the cross, whose interest is he looking out for? There's nothing to gain by him going to the cross and dying on that cross. The person that, that has something to gain is you and I, right? That that ability to, uh, not only does God say, well, you know, you people should do this. Right? I'm not going to do it, but you people should do it. Everything that, that God asks of us is the thing that he's willing to do. And this is part of the beauty of the 
um, the lack of duplicity that lives in the gospel message and what Christianity really proclaims about what God asks of us, but the fact that those things that he asks of us are already the things that are true about him. And so these are the things that are true about him. Verse 6, it says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I encourage you to, uh, to be in God's word. Um, for the purpose of discovering what God's like and to be able to, uh, to see and have a vision for what my life ought to look like. Because whatever Jesus is modeling uh, in the midst of his life is the same thing that he's calling us to be and to do. Uh, this is the building program. This is the, uh, um, the blueprint for my life and yours. That we're not boxers who are beating in the air uh, as it says in the New Testament, but we're, we've got a plan. There's something that God has for us. And that thing that God has for us is for you and I to become more and more like Christ. Um, which begs the question, what does God look like? Which begs the question of like, how could I find out? And the answer is simply rooted in being in God's word um, for the purpose of discovering more and more what God's like. And I think that when you and I discover more and more what God's like and how different that is from all the things that get modeled uh, in front of us, I would say, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to say this without uh, people kind of going on. I, I, I kind of like the craziness of our day and the, uh, the knuckleheadedness of so many people. Uh, and, and for the ways that we're like, it shouldn't be like this. Yeah, you're right. Um, and I think if you took a good hard look at the way God asks us to interact with our world uh, and the ways that he interacts with us, it would be very different. Uh, and so to, to learn how to be inspired by the different thing, the better thing, the God thing, uh, and to become more like him <laughs> and less like me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, life in your name, and I thank you for the ways that you bring it to us, and I thank you for the ways that you want nothing but uh, the very best for us, and for uh, ways in which we've followed the model of the world. I pray that you would help us to yield that up and to give that over to you and to uh, say we're sorry for ways that that's uh, not brought life to us or maybe to the people around us, and for the ways in which we want to uh, yield ourselves to you. Uh, to grow more and more into your likeness and becoming more and more like you. Give us insight into the ways that we're falling short in that and help us um, to gain the strength and the resources and the interest and the desire uh, and even asking you to help us uh, to become the people that we aren't so that we can become like you. Uh, in your name I pray, amen. God bless your week.